Um, hello and welcome. Thanks for finding the room and everything. Um, so this will be a tale of drama and romance between TensorFlow and Solar. Here's the plot. Uh, we're going to go from high level to lower level. So we're going to talk about the use case, some architecture choices, and then uh, some words about building a model in Python and then how we can use it in a Solar Query Parser. And then finally, when we have the Query Parser, um, Rafael is going to do a demo of packaging it as a Solar package and running it in Solar and yeah. All right. So from the very high level, the problem we're trying to solve is query expansion, right? So the user sends a query. We want to make it nicer. Uh, we're going to run with the simplest possible um, scenario, which is query tagging. So we're going to classify the text of the query and add a label to it um, to boost it, for example. But the same flow can probably apply to name entity recognition or personalization, maybe, whatever query expansion we want to do. So at the end, we want a better query. All right, so um, typically, the way we will, would do this is the query, uh, the user sends a query, and you have an API of some sort, because you're not exposing Solar directly, and then you have a, a separate service that serves the model, which is a good idea. I'm not saying it's bad in any way. I think the only disadvantage, really, is that extra hop and um, if you do, for example, autocomplete, that might um, add too much latency. And also, if you want to be close to, like, for example, I assume the API kind of has, is very close to your business logic, and then Solar is very close to your data, because that's where your data is. Um, the model is somewhat separate, so maybe it doesn't have that good of an access to if you want to involve any of those things, which we don't here, but just hypothetically speaking. So to avoid that extra latency, you can do two things. You can either uh, serve the model directly in your API, so you'd be closer to the business logic, or you can serve it from Solar, which is what we're going to look at today. Uh, so then you'll be closer to the data. All right, um, so um, assuming uh, we want to serve it from Solar, like where in Solar do we want to do that? And today we're going to look at Query Parser, which as I said, it's not necessarily the greatest idea. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the point is, the Query Parser is returning a Lucene query, right? So it, it looks at the query string from the user and uh, it, it returns a Lucene query out of it. And uh, that's all great. We're as close to the index as we can possibly be. Uh, the downside is that at that point, and there are more downsides actually that Rafael's going to talk about, but uh, one important one here at this stage is that when you get to the query parser, the HTTP parameters that come from the query are immutable. So that means we're going to run the same logic on every query parser. And that means we're going to run it on every shard, of the collection. Let's say we're hitting a collection with three shards. We're going to run it on every shard. And also, if the initial HTTP request is like on a fourth node that forwards the query, the query parser will also run there as well. So we usually don't want that unless, you know, if it's a single shard collection, then we don't care. We just run it once, and so that's not a problem. Um, so if we have a multi shard collection, maybe a uh, a bigger model, so we don't want to do this, all this redundant work. Uh, we can go up the stack, so there's a search component, and, but there's also the search handler, which is your HTTP endpoint, your slash select, or whatever you're using. And that's where uh, the HTTP parameters are mutable. So you can inject some logic there, and you can tell Solar, okay, we've already parsed the query, don't worry about it anymore. And in fact, Solar does it out of the box for distributed queries. So it when uh, the query is sent to the shards, uh, this trip false is injected. You may have seen this in the logs. And so we can do the same with our own logic. We can say it's already been expanded, just jump over the logic. All right, but we're going to go with the query parser. All right, so we need a model um, to do that classification, the query tagging. And um, all, so all the code that we're talking about here is uh, on GitHub and with quite a few references. And um, all right, so like if, if you just want to build like a very simple classification, there is um, on the TensorFlow's website, 
uh, there is a nice tutorial about doing classification on top of BERT that you can follow. Um, problem is, I got my first roadblock at step one, which is pip install TensorFlow. That's where pip just said, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Turns out, um, at least up to about a month ago, uh, TensorFlow had no binary distribution for Apple Silicon. Uh, so you could build it from sources, but then there's some other things, like if you want to use TensorFlow text, you have got the same problem there. Um, so TensorFlow text, as of yesterday, still doesn't have a Apple Silicon distribution. So I just ended up using an Intel um, processor. <laughs> um, all right, then the second problem is, and we'll, we're going to expand on that quite a bit, um, is that and that tutorial, you know, you're going to build a model. It's all nice and works. The, uh, the problem is that model also does the BERT tokenization, like within the model. And TensorFlow Java doesn't seem to support that, or at least we could make it work for the life of us. So we ended up doing the BERT tokenization outside the model. So before we send data to the model, we do the to tokenization. So we're going to expand on, on how to do that and everything. Uh, and that stems from an article that is, um, there's a link to it on GitHub. Problem is, TensorFlow doesn't, like if you're used to how Solar does backwards compatibility, TensorFlow is not all that serious about it. So uh, that code, we couldn't make it work on the latest versions of, of TensorFlow. So we, we got back um, quite a few versions. Um, not that many, but you know, quite a few. Um, but then we realized there's quite a narrow range of Python versions that are supported by every TensorFlow version. So you have to be mindful of that as well. <laughs> and then lastly, it's like the dependency hell issues that we've seen in other languages as well, <coughs> Java, where let's say, let's, okay, okay. Let's say you want to install pandas. Pandas depends on NumPy. TensorFlow also depends on NumPy. So you need to make sure that the NumPy versions are within kind of the same range, right? Uh, so again, we have a working example there, but the point is you probably have want to look at uh, pandas that were released about the same time as your TensorFlow version. All right, so once all the stars are aligned, we'll build a model. And um, for this BERT tokenizi tokenizing that happens outside the model, that's pretty straightforward. Two things to remember. Uh, one is um, each query will um, basically be tokenized and you have a vocabulary and what it outputs is a list of tokens which is like the entry in the vocabulary so it's an, an integer and then we would prepend this with CLS and we'll end with SEP so every query is like CLS token 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 SEP and then we also need to make sure that all queries have the same length so we'll probably just choose a number of tokens that we say we support if the query is longer than that we just chop it off if the query is shorter, we're just going to append uh, tokens of zero. All right, and then um, when we so when we build the model and when we use the model, we need to make sure that our Python code, which is up on the top, and the Java code. I'm just putting what I thought are relevant snippets. If I was going to expand on the Java side, um, we need to make sure that things are in sync. So that maximum number of tokens, and yes, we're bad at variable names. In Python, we call it max sec length, and in Java, we call it max vector length here, so they need to be the same, right? We define it, I think we said 32. Mm -hmm. um, right, then the data type. So I said, when we do the tokenization, that's gonna input an integer, so that's our data type. It's in 32 here, it's in 32 here as well. It has to be the same. Um, and then our model. So the model has a main function, which is called by default, serving default. If you change that in Python, that needs to be reflected in Java as well. And then what we also care about are, you know, from the model, like when we're interacting to it, we're talking to the initial layer, which in our case is called input IDs. That has to be the same. And then when we get the predictions from it, um, that's the last layer. So we call it predictions here. It has to be the same name over here as well. Um, and also, the model uh, will output a number. Like, it's not going, going to output the actual class. So if you want to use the class in the query, we need the mapping between the number and the actual class name. Right, so let's say we want to uh, distinguish between careers or techniques or whatever. 
uh, those would go probably into a file where it's like one class per line or something like that. Like, you have to have this synchronization. It's not terribly complicated, but it has to be there. Okay. So now, the, let's take a step back. And how now that we have the model, what to do to actually incorporate it in solar? Well, there are four steps, basically, that we can think of from a higher level perspective. First, as Radu mentioned, we want to include and combine the goodies of two words. We want the uh, full text search, and we want the classification to be present. So first of all, uh, we'll parse the query using Lucene Query Parser in our query parser. Then we do the tokenization and classification, finally combine all of that into a single query that will be run uh, against our index. But for now, let's completely forget about the step one and four, and let's first see how our awesome Python model uh, can be incorporated uh, and actually used in Java. And that's not that complicated once you figure out everything works and things are compatible with each other. So first of all, what we did is we created a tokenizer class, a very simple Java class that uses two things that are important. The Bertful tokenizer and the vocabulary to initialize that, basically. The others are like, you know, minimum frequency, which was kind of a test for us, and the max vector length, which Radu already mentioned, is the length of the query that we support. So we need to uh, take uh, care about it, basically. So how we initialize that? Well, that's pretty simple. We just provide a path and get the file to the vocabulary and then use a builder uh, to build that. Nothing, nothing uh, complicated here. Once we have the vocabulary, we can initialize the Bertful tokenizer class, provide the vocabulary, and then decide if we want to use lower casing or not. In our case, we do, uh, which, we'll, which we will see in when we combine all the things together. So this is the first step of the tokenization, initialization, and then, of course, the tokenization itself. <laughs> so uh, what... Uh, we expect to provide is this int and DRA class, and we need to construct it. The way we can do it is, first of all, tokenize that. And of course, you know, the sentence here will be the sentence, the query that actually our user provides to Solar. So this is what we tokenize using the BERT tokenizer, which uh, gives us a list of strings. You know, the same thing as in uh, Solar, you get the, the tokens. Then we fill up the array of longs with the positions of those tokens in the vocabulary. Basically, that's it. And check uh, if the uh, length of the query isn't higher than 32 or lower. If it's higher, we just forget about you know, this long tail. Well, that's the limitation. And if it's lower than 32, we just append zeros to it. To use at the end and to get the int and the array, we can use the ND arrays utility class and vector of method of it, but it requires an integer array, so we just map to it uh, at the end, and this is how tokenization is done. Pretty simple, nothing, nothing complicated, just some kind of a boilerplate code in Java that needs to be written. So let's move forward to classification. And uh, so again, simple class, that's why I'm only focusing on this classify method of it. Nothing, no, there is not much interesting thing apart from it. The thing is, we have to remember that the model will output an integer. So we will need to map that to the class itself. So, but first things first. What we do here is first of all, have this our int and the array, so uh, filled up, because we need it to provide that as an input to the first layer of the model. So we use, first of all, we create it and then fill it up using our tokenizer. This is exactly the place where the tokenizer is used. Then we create a tensor with the tint32 class tensor off and provide that input array. This needs to match our type in the model. This is one of the requirements. And then we create a simple map with a string and a tensor as a uh, string as a key and the tensor as the value and provide the input ID's key. This is, again, a static value that the model expects the name of the uh, layer and call the model itself. This is where the magic happens, right? This is where the model is actually called the default, default function, serving default. We already saw that in the Python code and call to provide the uh, parameters, arguments for the uh, for, like prediction to happen, and results are again a map of uh, string keys and tensor. And as Radu mentioned, 
uh, we will get the predictions in the, under the key called predictions. This is the last uh, layer of the uh, network that are all the model. And this is a tfloat32 value. So what we do with that is we just all iterate over the results of the model and find the, you know, the, the position basically that is the best. And if that's something higher than minus one, which we set on top, we, result, we return the best position. Otherwise, we return an empty string, whatever we want. This is up to us because we will be the ones using the model uh, in uh, solar itself. Okay, so that's classification. And we have that done. Tokenization and classification. We can finally get to solar. So from solar perspective, and we already mentioned, this is not the best idea to use that in a query parser, <laughs> just to be fair. Uh, but we promised to deliver that, so let's like, move forward with that. So in solar, you have to, in order to have the query parser, just like with the most plugins, to have it done, you need two classes. You need the plugin query, query parser itself, and you need a plugin that will initialize that. So the first thing is the initial initialization plugin. We extend the QParser plugin and just override the create parser function method. Uh, it, the, it provides us with the query string, local params, params, and the solar request. At the query request. The only thing that you may see that rings a bell is actually that the create parser is called for a query, right? And we create a query parser out of the query, which means that we will create that query parser each time a query comes in. Well, if that's the case, then you can think of uh, problems with the model, because if our model will be created every time and loaded every time that uh, actually runs a query and you have hundreds of queries per second, well, the latency will not be great. I can, you have to believe me, but I'll show that during the demo actually. It takes time and the larger model you have, it needs time to load, initialize itself and so on. So that's, not, that's why query parser is not the best place, but still, we dedicated to that, let's move forward. Uh, so we know about that. Now let's move forward to that query parser itself. We extend the QParser uh, class, and uh, like I'll show you the parse method in a second, but the initialization is quite simple. We need two things, We've we already told, talked about that. We will use the goodies from the full text search world, and we will use the classification results as well. So we have Lucene query parser and BBus classifier. This is what we, what we need. We initialize that, so we just uh, create the Lucene query parser, pass in all the params, and we, were, and we are done, and we set up the classifier. This is pretty simple as well, nothing, nothing that you would ex wouldn't expect. We load the classes, and this is like a line by line loading from a file, eight, cl eight classes or something like that. We load them into a string to be able to tell which class actually the model uh, provided to the classifier of, uh, uh, and use it. Then we have the save model bundle. And this is where you can actually expect problems. Whenever you have incompatibilities of Python versions, of Java versions, like uh, the things that Radu mentioned, like not having the right classes in Java, you will have exceptions where you'll be trying to load the model here using the save model bundle. And we hit like numerous. We wanted to show something, but then decided the, not to show like 20 different exceptions, right? Th those are, were different. and. Uh, they came from Python, uh, including like the tokenizer and Java not supporting that. That's kind of of the game uh, that we play here. But ev if everything works, you know, the thing is that you only provide load the model di directory when it is on your uh, local machine or, or server, and then the, serve of the name of the function, that's serve. And then the same with the BBus tokenizer, you see how we initialize that, we provide a vocabulary file, the path to it, and uh, whether we want to lowercase or not, return the classifier, that's it. We can now move, uh, ah, this is actually, sorry, the load classes. As I mentioned, this is a sim very simple uh, boilerplate code that just loads the uh, files one by, uh, file one line by line uh, to a, a string uh, array. Nothing, uh, nothing more. But the parse method is where the things actually are all combined together. So we use the Lucene query parser initially, we parse the query, 
take the query and you know we build the simplest thing possible. So we take the Boolean query and uh, take one part, the Lucene one with the must uh, occurrence clause, Boolean clause, so a must clause, and append the second one as a should. Basically, you can imagine boost the results or <clears throat> whatever. And we do it here so we can see we classify the string and if the classification is not empty, we add another term query. And that's basically it. And this is how it works and we close the classifier. But as we mentioned, you know, there are a few problems. Memory usage. One of those is whatever you, like the more complicated and the larger model you use, the higher the memory usage. And you know, solar is after all a search engine, you know, an analytics engine if you call it then, but still it runs on Java. So all that memory will be adding up to the usage of your JV, of the heap of your JVM. That's not perfect, I would say. Uh, the query parser is actually created with each query. So we know what is the downside of that, right? And the second, but like the third thing, of course, is the latency that adds up when the model is loaded with each query request. There are hacky solutions to that. Don't do this at home, kids. Uh, you could use a static initialization, but I'm only showing that, you know, I should do it on red because you shouldn't do it like this. What I would do is I would move a stack up, uh, as Rad mentioned, you know, search handler component. There are better ways to handle that. But still, if you really need to go with the query parser approach, then there are options that you can uh, go for. Now, if the gods of demo will be kind enough, we'll be able to show you how that all works. Uh, ha! The other way. Well, the other way around. Yeah. Ha! You know, the first, first success. Okay, before we start, there is one thing that, actually two things. So I have my solar here already, and in the plugin directory, if we go there, I already have my uh, compiled and shaded jar. This is quite a large jar actually, because you know, it has all the things or uh, all the classes with it, apart from uh, Lucene and Solar, that is fine. Uh, I also have like configuration and model files here, but the other thing that we have to remember is that w the model itself will be unpacked somewhere. And the model can be large. We don't want to actually put it into Zookeeper, you know? There is a limitation of how uh, much data you can put into Zookeeper actually. By default, it's one meg. Uh, apart from that, Zookeeper try, will, will cry out and you'll have to either set it up to accept those files, but then the performance drops and you don't want Zookeeper performance to drop in your solar cloud uh, clusters. Uh, that can turn out really, really bad. And uh, so what we did instead, <laughs> don't do this at home, kids. Uh, but what we did is we actually turn uh, off one thing. Mm. There is a keyword called security here. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know where this is going. Sell the security manager enabled equals false. Yeah. The way to go, do it is actually create a Java policy file that will allow your JVM to load and its class loader to load the data outside of the, the directories that the, it is allowed to work with. But you know, this is the demo, we want it to be simple. Solar security manager enabled equals false. It's actually supported by Solar. So we just use the feature, uh, okay? I, ha I have that, no, I don't want to have the changes done and uh, you know how it goes with the live demos and all the commands that we need to run. I have created with Radu uh, a just file with a few steps that we will run to show you a few things today. Luckily, they will be visible and I'll comment on those. What we want to do now, assuming we have a running solar instance that accept packages, we would like not to restart it and not to you know, do anything around it to load the modules, create directories ourselves. Let's use solar and solar module, um, a loading module functionality to actually sign the module, uh, upload it to solar, use an API to create request handlers or create a collection with already pre-created configuration and use the model there. So how to do it, okay? Step one. Step one is actually start solar. So I'll say just 
step one, start solar. The key point here is that I'm enabling, enabling packages uh, functionality. So enable packages equals true, and this is a single you know, solar instance minus F in foreground minus C, uh, start the embedded zookeeper and uh, let it run. Okay, so we can move to the second uh, tab. This is again the same thing. To be able to use a solar package manager and upload the, the uh, binary files there, we need a key. And we need a private key, public key, and so on and so forth. So first, let's just create those keys. I'm using an open, open SSL gener SA command and I'm uh, creating a PEM file there. And the second thing is I also want the DRE key to be created uh, like a public key that I'll be using uh, as well. So those two commands are there. I, once, once they execute, you need of course the open SSL tool on your local system. You can see that we created, it's actually today, 19th of June. Uh, Czerwiec is June in Polish, so you have to believe me, it was created today. We have the BBAS key and BBAS key.pem. We can now use those keys to actually uh, move forward, okay? Just step three already. Now we will add the key to solar. It is as simple as running bin solar package add key, and we provide that uh, DRE uh, key that we took out of our PEM file. Now we can look into actual logs, and if that's visible, you can see that the file was actually added here. It's in node files underscore trusted underscore. If we would look into solar file system, we would see that uh, directory being created there in the file system, keys be bus key uh, add. That's fine, we have the key in solar, so we can move forward to step four, uh, just step four and sign our library with that key. So I'm using the digest from OpenSSL toolkit again. Um, I'm using the PEM file to sign in my plugin bbuzz onejar file. This is where my uh, module is located. And again, I'm then passing that on to encode into base64 and output basically a signature that I'll use when uploading the, uh, that particular uh, binary. So the next step is upload. Uh, you can see why we pre-created those uh, commands, right? So uh, the way it works right now, let me just show that, is I'm using curl and I'm providing that plugin uh, with the data binary. Uh, put it and use a solar API that is available under API cluster files. Then I provide the bbuzz, which is the name of the module that we come up with. It doesn't, have, it doesn't have to match with the name of the jar file. Then the version, the jar itself, and you can see the sig parameter in the query, which is exactly the signature that the previous step uh, provided. So we have that here. Let's verify if that was actually uploaded. Was step four, uh, clear, sorry about that, uh, clear. Okay, I think that was five. Ah, five was already there, sorry. Six, that will be upload check. To check the upload, the get request to the API node files, we provide the bbus, our module name, which is important. We'll, you'll see that in a second. 1.0, which is the version, and then we have the information. So bbus is present. This is the jar, the size, time stop when it was uploaded, the hash, and the signature used uh, for that. Now, let's move forward. We can get to step five, seven, so adding of that particular package actually into, uh, into solar. Again, API cluster package, this is uh, out of the box uh, available in solar. And we provide a JSON uh, request body that says add, and the package name called well, like package, the name, the version 1.0, and files. This needs to match in what we had in this, uh, what we uploaded to nodes, so the API nodes one. And you can see it actually matches the slash bbuzz, uh, all of that is present. We are almost there at step seven. Step eight is the verification, right? So just step eight. Uh, this is the check if everything is correct and we can see Solar sees that, we can move forward to create the collection. Whew. 
uh, too many things at once, right? But before that, I would like to show you one thing, uh, plugin config, solar config, which is kind of important uh, if you ask me. Those are two handlers, the first handler and the second handler that I'm creating, created for the demo. They are nothing out of the ordinary, but like, you know, but we have this dev type, which one uses the standard non-hacky approach. The second one is the one with static, just to demo that. We have the save model, save model directory, vocabulary file, classes file. I extracted that to the temp directory, and that's it. But one thing uh, that is important is the query parser itself definition. What you may have noticed here is that I'm using a prefix here, the bbuzz. This is important because we need to tell solar class loader <laughs> where to actually find the package. And if we wouldn't provide this uh, bbuzz prefix, solar will not find the class in the module. Mm, there is no way it does. Basically tells which class loader to use, right? So we have the configuration ready. We can just move forward. Just step nine, upload config, bin solar zk up config to the local host with the name bbuzz and directory plugin config. It should be already there in solar right now. The next step is creating of the collection. Again, nothing, nothing here that you probably are not aware of, so create collection bbuzz, one shard, replication factor of one. That, and we are done, we are ready to run queries. And I have three of them. Uh, the first one, uh, we have a query that we know that works. How do I become a data scientist? I would like to be one, right? So that's a proper query. And the first one will run against a select handler. This is step 10, I feel, ah, no, 11. I knew you would say that. Okay, let's look at the query. The parsed query to strings shows a normal, normal Lucene query that uh, was uh, cut into to tokens and run against like this default text field. So we see text how, text do, text I, nothing that would also the query time is nine milliseconds. That's important. The, look, one thing, I haven't mentioned that. There is no data here. Like nine milliseconds? Look, okay, whatever. But nine milliseconds full time, it's fine. This is the bug, so it's nothing to be worried about. Uh, we see the query. Let's now try to enrich it. So let's try using one of these uh, uh, models that we have. So I have just step 12. Run query two. This is exactly the same query, but you can see already the difference. At least I can let the the difference is clearly visible in the execution time, four seconds, uh, because of the initialization of the model. This is the this is the thing. The model takes time. Uh, to be initialized. And we can see, you know, running initialization on the save model bundle at path, uh, load tags and so on, took quite a lot. Uh, and yeah, the query works, uh, but uh, well, the query works. Uh, well, I didn't show that, but yeah, look, we, you if you remember, we created the query, uh, the um, Lucene, Lucene part uh, of the whole query parser that we wrote was in must uh, clause of Boolean query. So you can see that this is now against a name field. This is how it was configured actually, not against the text, but that doesn't really matter. So we have a plus, so we have a must part, and then at the end we have the interest, which is kind of a field that you know can be uh, used for classification here in our case. And we have added the career, uh, the career here. And now if we would actually run the query, the uh, step with the uh, <coughs> sorry, with the static initialization, it's already. Uh, you know, the model, the files were pre-cached, so, but you can see the first run is 1.3 second, the second should, the second should be uh, 500, no, 590 milliseconds. So you see, clearly see the difference in execution time when it comes to the static uh, initialization. But still, this is a classification result and it takes time for the classification to happen. So 
you know, from that perspective, uh, you may want to do it on API side as well. This is one of the options. You can cache the results and so on to speed that up. And this is nothing that is unusual. People do that, and, uh, but you know, we went that road, we promised that we will show you how to do it in the query parser. Hopefully, uh, come on, yeah. Hopefully that was entertaining. Hopefully you learned something. Uh, we have still time for questions. We mentioned we were faster a bit, you know, where we do it live. So here's Radu, I'm questions? Rahul. Thank you very much for attending and enjoy the conference. Any questions? Uh, <laughs> I mean, yay! <laughs> so, next year's talk will be how to do it right? Yes. <laughs> yes, we'll do it right the next time. Yeah, yes. I mean, it was exploratory, right? We thought it was a good idea initially, but then when we got into it, it was like, okay, we can't really hide that. <laughs> Some things are not ideal. Yeah, but uh, we learned uh, a bit here and there during, you know, doing the work, and I think that's the, that's the part that is fun. Uh, if, if you learn and if you take something out of it and can share it, why not? But yeah, we'll do it, if they like, accept us, we'll do it the right time, we'll do it the right way. No, but I think, <laughs> right. I think there's a lot of usable stuff. Like you can, if you push that up to the um, search handler, I think you know, pretty much everything else that you've seen would be the same. You know, from uh, from packaging to the actual code and the hook points and such. Yeah. I want to say it's very commendable and uh, impressive that you got the plugin stuff working. Um, I will say, for posterity's sake, on people in the video and stuff, like I think possibly like creating a Docker image with the binaries included, and I think you can put the model in there as well instead of putting it in ZooKeeper. Mm -hmm. Uh, might be easier. Yes. Yes. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm know, very impressed that you did the plugin stuff, though, especially in the demo. <laughs> uh, the the thing, for example, my experience is, you know, the uh, with the way we work with Python versions and so on, to be able to keep that intact and not fight with different environments is definitely a container and shipping like the build pa the build let's call it whatever package you have and, and ship it because it's like not only here if you're using Apache Beam or anything like it, that also has a, its own version. In GCP, it's Composer that contains of a certain version of Python. That's become a hell when you try to do ETL stuff on that. So definitely a container with the, everything built and just ship it. You can then include the packages that you want, the model itself and so on. You don't have to worry about that. But yeah, we decided to show, you know, you know some of us like, that there is a pack, um, packages functionality in Solar that actually works. Uh, so it's, it's really nice and yeah. But that's a very valid com comment, yeah. Just sort of to tag on that, the other strategy you could have applied, well two different strategies that would have helped you is first of all, use the right machine learning framework why torch? <laughs> um, that'd be number one. And then number two, uh, for the whole Python problem, just use a virtual environment, right? So you could use Conda, and then yeah. at least with Conda, right, you can have a YAML definition, and kabam, you can skirt a lot of this pain and suffering, because uh, Conda also does a better job of, of recreating and, and, and doing the dependency mapping, sense. and so then you just don't even have to, that as an issue. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah true, true that, that's, that's a valid approach. Yeah. You still need to figure out the right combination of versions, right? Like that doesn't... Yeah, well, it's, I, the dependency resolution in Conda, I find, certainly when you're using PyTorch, is almost like a non-issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot, lot less of an issue. I mean, you're going to, depending on what library you're using, you may bump into it, but it's just nothing even close to what you do. Yeah, because right. in our case, the problem was actually the Python was one problem. The second problem was inter intercompatibility between, between, you know, the TensorFlow in Java and the Python version. Because Python itself, we could have yeah, taken the very okay. latest version and it works. But yeah. the problem is that Provided then it doesn't Intel. work with Java. And you will, we had to like find not only then the Python models and you know, have that on the same level uh, of compatibility, but then also make it work in Java, which was the main problem, I think. Uh, like the yeah. save model bundle load was a hell of a uh, experience when we tried to do it, find the proper solution, proper model that will uh, basically work for us. 
Yeah, because their error messages are also very informative. <laughs> <laughs> so next, so next time it would be PyTorch and Search Handler. And no errors. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, so you use the TensorFlow model for classification, mm -hmm. integrated in solar. What do you think about uh, integrated in solar creating a filter that uses a TensorFlow model to generate embeddings at index time? That would be nice, and then if you, ah, and then you basically just do cosine similarity or whatever at, mm -hmm. at query time. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's possible. That'd be nice. Yeah. Why not? So that would be part of the analysis chain, or no, part of the query. What's that called? Index. In in order, yeah, because in order to Index have that then matched in the hmm? query, update yeah, update, update processor. processor yeah, yeah, you would have to like you know uh, write the embeddings into your index and then use yeah. that from the query to, uh, query be. time. So we'll have like one more point of integration, um, uh, not only the query time integration but also the indexing time integration, which is. But yeah, that's doable. Okay, thank you very Thanks. much. We'll be here for the conference, so if you have any kind of questions or to chat, yeah, yeah. reach out. Thanks a lot thank once you. again. <laughs>